everyone and welcome along to this week's Energy Futures Lab uh, lunchtime webinar. My name is Connor. I'm the Communications Manager at the Institute and it's my pleasure to welcome this week's speaker, uh, which is uh, Dennis Fraga from the uh, Department of Earth Sciences and Engineering. Dennis is a doctoral researcher within the Minerals, Energy and Environmental Engineering Research Group. His expertise is in techno-economic evaluation of small-scale liquefied natural gas chains, natural gas pipeline expansion projects, and drilling rig campaigns. His PhD research is on the techno-economic and life cycle assessment of CO2 transport, specifically aimed at assessing the role of CCS logistics chains in enabling more economic, sustainable, and faster project deployments at regional level. Dennis has an MSc in energy from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and a master's uh, certificate in petroleum economics from IFPEN in France. He's worked uh, for over eight years in the upstream and downstream sectors of the oil and gas industry uh, in both Brazil and here in the UK, including in areas such as natural gas supply contracts, pipeline project development, onshore and offshore drilling, bidding processes, and shareholder relationship management. So Dennis is gonna speak for around 30 minutes, and then there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, uh, just pop it in the Q&A uh, function which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen and feel free to like other questions if somebody has uh, posed a question that you're interested in hearing the answer to. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. If you wouldn't like your name read out, uh, you can submit your questions anonymously if you wish. So with uh, that, I'm going to ask Dennis uh, to uh, share his screen and get today's uh, presentation underway. Thanks, Connor. Hi, everyone. Um, let me just get it going. So if you cannot see uh, first slide, please give me a shout, Connor. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to speak about the role of batchwise CO2 transport in the carbonizing Europe industry. And I will show you an implementation of this in a Norwegian CCS chain. This has been part of my PhD research, which has been, which is supervised by Professor Anna Koch and Dr. Zengeni. So to start, the agenda for today is divided in five elements. The first one, I will give you a bit of background on CCS and, and to set a common understanding on, on the challenge of those chains. Then will be a, a review of the current technology options and followed by the optimization of Norwegian CCS chain used a mixed integer linear program model. This uh, implementation will show you some elements assessed, some possible configurations, uh, some sizing concepts for intermediate hub and geological storage, and the model itself and some results. This will be followed by uh, benchmark and conclusions, and then I will give you a bit of uh, future work and and some publications that have been derived from this research so far. Okay, so to start, currently CCS storage rate is globally around 40 million tons per annum, which is well below the, the expected amount of CC of rate, the storage rate in the energy forecast. For instance, this figure of 5.6 gigatons per annum was taken from International Energy, energy Agency last year's report. So this means uh, the capacity should grow for around 140 times, which is about 80% per annum. It's a tremendous task for CCS deployment as to, to help tackling the, the climate goals that we that were set in the Paris Agreement. But I, th I think it's, it's doable and projects are taking off. So uh, I'm just picturing below these this statements, uh, overview of the existing projects globally, so we can see in North America, most of them are pipeline transported CO2 to perform EOR, enhanced oil recovery in the, in the in onshore fields in the US and Canada. There is some C CCS project in, in Santos Basin in Brazil, which is just about the separation of CO2 from the exploration of oil, and then it's been re-injected, but it's also a EOR-like project. And more recently, we've seen in Europe uh, a bunch of projects taking place. So in, in the Netherlands, in Norway and in UK as well. So a few projects such as like Teesside and Northern Lights and Portos in the Netherlands. And those projects are particularly interesting because they are mostly related to CCS 
not uh, CCUS, let's say this way, when the U stands for utilization of CO2. And, and they are facing a lot of challenge because they, they aim to connect different stationary meters from the industry sector with different transport modes. And this is mostly what I, what I would like to stress a bit about in the next slide. So we can see here a, a, a zoom in in the Europe, European context of CCS projects. So on, on the dark blue, uh, we see the stationary meters around uh, all of those, most of the countries shown here. Uh, as um, light blue, we see the UK's alternative storage projects with the ACORN project and Net Zero T site. And on the red, we see the Northern Lights storage site with the Long Ship project, which is the one of the most advanced uh, CCS projects in Europe. So uh, I think this slide is very interesting because it, it shows us the the nature of the stationary meters. So they are coastally dispersed. They are they have very different emission profiles since they come from different industry sectors. And also they should have as well a different technology for capturing CO2, which would be deployed with a different timing. So this possess, poses a, a challenge in setting up those chains because you, you might have stationary emitters being connected in, in five, ten years time. And on top of that, you should find as well multiple storage side options. So which would be interesting to see some sort of competition for the cheapest storage option and for those stationary meters. So this um, this figure illustrates a bit of the motivation of the research, which is try to find uh, a method to optimize the setting up of those chains. And so far, this method is accounting only for cost, but in the future, it, it will account for emissions as well. So uh, to a bit of background of CO2, I think it's worth to, to, to understand the phase diagram of CO2 because it, it gives you a lot of uh, insights on how to condition CO2 for either transport or geological storage. So we can see on this figure that for storage, it has to be above critical point. So essentially higher temperature, higher pressures, then for pipeline is just slightly above the critical point at the days phase fluid. So it's uh, heated and compressed. But when it comes for batch wise transportation, which is the focus of this presentation, it has to be liquefied. So it has to be cooled down and it has to be pressurized to a certain level that CO2 becomes liquid. So what we discuss about here is just like bringing CO2 to this area for transportation then afterwards you have to do some duty to bring to make it this in this area for injection and and or you can have CO2 at this phase for pipeline transport, which is going to be liquefied afterwards and then further injected. So these are the parameters the model has to account for when dealing with the CO2. And whenever it poses a risk for moving the CO2 condition to either too cold or too high a pressure, it, you have the risk of getting solid CO2, which is uh, uh, in, uh, asset integrity major risk for the operations. When it comes to transport modes, we, we have basically two options. So first one is batch wise, which needs uh, intermediate storage facility as, as illustrated here. This is uh, required to allow a constant flow and also to adjust the flow rate if needed due to any maintenance or any injection rate constraints that might, might exist. And the batch wise transportation is essentially performed by ships. So this we, we assess as medium and low pressures, being low pressure around seven bar and medium pressure around 15 bar. With the latter, the capacities are ranging from one kiloton of CO2 to up to, to 50 kilotons of CO2, whereas for medium pressure, this has been a much lower capacity range from 1 to 10, for instance, although there is a, a lot of debate on how to bring the storage for medium pressure in higher capacities for transport ship, it's yet to face some technical challenges and some 
some cost barriers as well. Um, when it comes to lorries, it has been widely used for the food grade CO2 transportation. Its re capacity ranging is much smaller. It's like an order of magnitude lower than ships, so between 10 to 30 tons of CO2 can be transported by ships. It is, it's also perhaps feasible in a vo smaller volumes and shorter distances. Surprisingly, recently I, I attended to a, a webinar from the Northern Lights project, and uh, it was being said that the connection from one of the emitters of the Norwegian chain is being done by ship to the harbor for transport by, pardon, by lorries to the harbor to be transported by ships. So this was, this was a surprise because it's uh, 0.3 million tons per annum, but the distance between the harbor and the, the stationary emitter is very, very small. It's like 10 kilometers. So this would be essentially uh, something that would be triggering, tr triggering a pipeline, but in this case for perhaps uh, geographical or technical reasons or perhaps uh, disturbance of the area reasons, uh, lorries has been adopted. Well, and, and the other transport mode, which is the mostly adopted worldwide, is pipelines. So there are around more than 8,000 kilometers of pipeline transporting CO2 already installed around the globe. And the main drivers for costs of those pipelines are materials, labors, labor costs, right of way, and, and other costs. So now we covered a bit of background, so we move into how those elements are ready for deployment. So before we, we analyze each of them, it's worth to translate the CCS technology, the CCS chain in elements. So here we assume that CCS is divided in capture elements, conditioning elements, transport elements, intermediate storage and inj injection and geological storage. So each of those are with different uh, readiness level which are shown below in this figure here. But we can see uh, straight after straight that uh, the transport modes, either by pipelines onshore and offshore and ships, they are already at a commercial level, readiness level, followed by the saline aquifer and EOR injection geological storage. They are already at readiness level, maximum readiness level. They capture elements for post-combustion for mines and pre-combustion. They are also in the commercial level of readiness. Uh, this, this figure is from 2018, so perhaps most of these um, demonstrations, some of them might have progressed to, might, might have progressed to, to your techno commercial refinement requirements and or even further but uh, it, it gives us a, a a nice view of how those things are evolving so for instance uh, depleted oil and gas field is a technology that is is evolving fast with the portos project in the netherlands and and bioenergy with ccs has been evolved quite significantly along with direct air capture so the trend is some of those technologies here will move forward for commercial scale and they will be enable, enabling the deployment of CCS at the scale that we need it. But for this presentation, we, we are not covering the capture element. We're just focusing from conditioning onwards. So uh, this modeling uh, analyzes the conditioning, transport, intermediate storage, and geological storage. Okay, so now uh, starting with the optimization model. First, we have to set the elements as to be assessed from the Norwegian chain in this particular case. So we can see here in this map that the chain is quite, uh, it translates uh, not in, in integrally, but it's somehow the figure I presented before of the Norwegian, of the European stationary meters and the complexity of the storage sites. So it brings us um, five emitters with different emission profiles. So we have here a waste plant, a refinery in Sweden, a cement plant in Breivik, and also a fertilizer plant, and also a natural gas processing plant here, and all those four in Norway. These, uh, these emitters, they have different timing to come on stream, and also they can have different emission profiles depending on their activities. Therefore, it has been assumed two scenarios of supply. 
we can see here uh, they are divided by periods. So the whole time horizon of the model is 30 years and it has been grouped in periods of six years each. So the first scenario, we start with uh, 1 million ton per annum and it goes up to 22 million tons per annum in the fifth period. The second scenario starts with a slightly higher emission for with 1.22 and it goes up quite substantially higher to 38.56. Uh, most of this increase, it has been assumed in a hypothesis that uh, European sources will be shipping CO2 to this point here in closeness. So significant amount of CO2 will be delivered in closeness, whereas uh, a slightly increase is being expected from those guys here in, in Sweden and in Norway. When it comes to the geological storage sites, four storage sites were assessed and they, they have different availability in terms of periods and also different storage capacities. So Aurora has, is available from starting point with 207 million tons capacity. Ismeaya, Alpha and Gamma is starting from second period and Alpha having a very smaller capacity of storage, whereas Gamma is a, a, slightly, is a, is a higher capacity of storage. And ultimately, Troll Field, which is a, a producing field in Norway, is available in the fifth period with a huge amount of storage capacity of around five gigatons of CO2. So those scenarios were reported in this aligned project uh, deliverable. And the next step is to explore the combinations that would be possible with this, this uh, as elements that, that could set up a CCS chain. So here we, we try to illustrate the, the element and the connections that would be possible. So on the left, we see the figure with uh, the elements of the, the CCS chain. So the emitter area here, the transport intermediate storage hub, then transport again and intermediate storage hub followed by transport and geological storage. So on the, the diagram, we, CO2 can be conditioning at, conditioned at the emitter site, then further transported by either by ships or lorries to the intermediate hub, which can receive as well CO2 from pipelines from an emitter and conditioning it as well, allowing it to be transported to by ships to another intermediate storage hub. And then from this intermediate storage hub, you can have multiple options for in ge in ge uh, geological storage. So it can be by another ship to a platform. It can be by a transport ship to a vessel. It can also be by a pipeline at supercritical stage to, uh, to the field. And the last um, possibility that this model provides is that CO2 can be directly shipped from a uh, from the emitter to the intermediate to the geological storage side, pardon. So this gives us uh, two pressure designs of seven and 15 bar and uh, work uh, parameters for conditioning and liquefaction and compression, three types of pipeline, onshore pipelines, three types of offshore pipelines, uh, ship capacities between six to 50 kilotons and lorries from nine to 30 tons of CO2. When it comes to injection CO2 from a non-shore intermediate storage, storage, storage hub, the, all the subsea elements are performed by either the satellite platform or the intermediate storage hub itself. And the injection capacity for the ship that does a straight injection is just about 10 kilotons. Right, uh, so now we, we, we sort of defined our transport options. So next step is to how to size and the, in, the intermediate storage hub, as well as the wells and subsea elements. So for the storage hub, it's, um, we, we consider that the downstream shape capacity is the storage capacity required upstream. So we see on, we can see in this figure here that between the emitter and the storage hub, there is a link with a transport ship with four kilotons of CO2. That means this, this emitter should be able to have a storage of four kilotons of CO2. And the intermediate storage hub itself, since it has a transport link with another intermediate storage hub, it, it has to have 
a 10 kiloton capacity, which is the capacity of the ship that's going, connecting both intermediate storage hubs. So this concept was observed in the Netherlands studies and UK as well. And it has also been used in for the LNG sector. So for the wells uh, sizing and subsea elements design, we, uh, we adopted the, the approach called the easier chain approach, which was incorporated in the feed report from Netherlands project. Basically, it connects uh, the well to an integration unit and then for the satellite wells in series, which makes it easier for uh, maintenance and it results in lower costs for umbilicals and connecting the wells to the host platform or inland location. So we assume this can be done for this uh, implementation and the maximum well number of wells per integration unit is five. So either you have one integration unit with one well and up to four satellite wells. Then if you need more wells, you have another integration unit. Right, so once all those elements of the chain are parameterized, we set up the objective function, which is in, in this case is to minimize the total cost. Therefore, total cost is comprised by the total conditioning costs, total transport costs, total intermediate storage costs and the total geological storage costs. This optimization is subject to mass balance constraints, root constraints, so we tell the model some of the routes that are unfeasible. For, for instance, some pipeline routes are unfeasible due to geography or uh, engineering limitations and, and perhaps environmental limitations as well. So the model reads it. He also considers the mode, cap the transport capacity and these designs and timing for the injection field storage that we just presented. OK, so now we, we are going to look at the first results we get from this model. So here I'm presenting you the network chain evolution. And we are looking here at the first scenario of supply which is totally around 298 megatons of CO2 stored. This scenario has two pressure designs since we, as we I just described, so seven and 15 bar. So here on the first period, we see the three emitters are considered. So we have the waste plant, the cement plant and the refinery here. The cement plant is connected to the hub by pipeline. The injection field activated is Aurora, since uh, it has is the only one able to be receiving CO2 from this first period. And in terms of the transport ships, we have two systems. So the first system is a system with uh, six kilotons capacity connecting the waste plant and the refinery to the intermediate storage hub. And the second system is a high, much higher capacity such as 50 kilotons capacity connecting both intermediate storage hubs. This is for seven bar configuration. For 15 bar configuration, we still there is still uh, two systems. However, this system connecting the intermediate storage hubs, they have much greater number of ships, but uh, at lower capacity. So instead of 50 kilotons of CO2, this the model suggests 10 kilotons of CO2 capacity. The subsequent two periods, second and third, then we have all emitters on stream. So the natural gas processing plant in Cosmos is on stream and also the fertilizer plant here called Yara is also connected to the chain. So there is an additional onshore pipeline connecting Yara to the hub and the remaining aspect of the chain is maintained. So in terms of transport ships and pipelines for injection in Aurora. So there is a change in the last two periods due to the increased CO2 flow from Kosnes and other European sources. Ismaia Gama field is activated via offshore pipeline and the upstream elements of the chain are still the same. So this is basically the evolution for the first scenario. So we can see in the first period, there is a, a huge setup, uh, perhaps a, a relevant capex uh, expenditure, uh, capital expenditure to set up the systems and the infrastructure. 
and in further periods it's marginally increasing for with pipelines and perhaps additional wells to open and inject more inject more CO2 in the reservoir. Right, so a bit a bit of uh, in-depth analysis on the transport results for both pressure scenarios. So on the left we see for seven bar. So the bars here they mean either chips quantities of number of pipeline segments. So we can see the six kiloton ships start with two and it keeps up pretty much the same quantity throughout the horizon. However, for for the for the higher capacity ships with 50 kilotons, it starts with one and then the fourth and fifth period it needs additional additional ships to handle the CO2. This can be seen as well in the number of trips here, which is a stacked line for ship capacity. So we can see that we start with uh, just about 200 trips per annum and it reaches above 400 trips per annum in the last period. For the transport result with higher pressure, the pattern is similar. However, the number of ships to connect both hubs is much greater than the seven bar configuration. So we, we start with two 10 kiloton ships and it goes up to five in the last period, as well as with the number of trips, which is greater than, than with seven bar. Now looking at the geological storage elements, so we ended up having two integration units, units installed with six satellite wells. So the first was our other field, the first period here. So it's a, there is an integration unit and well. Then follow in the second period, two satellite wells are added to handle the increased CO2 flow. And in the fourth and fifth periods, we can see in the fourth period, the installation of another integration unit with another four satellite wells in Smehaya Gama to handle the remaining excess of CO2. This figure below here, it shows us uh, the remaining capacity of CO2 available per field on the positive axis, and on the negative, it shows the injected CO2 in the period. So we see Aurora starts being used since it was the only one available, and when the volumes increase, Smehaya Gama is activated and and is activated due to lower operational costs for injection in Smehaya Gama and also for the shorter distance between Smehaya Gama and the intermediate storage hub. Now, uh, jumping to the cost figures of this uh, optimization, the seven bar configuration accounted for about 4.1 billion euros and the 15 bar around 4.6 billion euros. So it's a slightly higher cost figure for 15 bar. In terms of how these uh, investments, these, uh, these total costs it are spread all, all over the periods, we see the first period with a uh, high investment in the transport elements of the chain. Then the subsequent two periods with uh, predominantly injection cost driven costs happening due to increased uh, CO2 access on stream and then the last two periods we have uh, additional transport with the ship acquisition here and opening of Smehaya Gama along with the operational costs and additional wells to be installed. For the 15 bar figure the pattern for the period one to four is similar to the seven bar configuration however in the period fifth we see a constant increase in, in, in transport expenditures to to uh, to deploy additional ships as long as with the wells. OK, so now uh, second scenario. Second scenario is a much higher number of uh, quantity of CO2 to be stored. So we jumped from almost 300 megatons of CO2 to 440 megatons for this scenario. In terms of network evolution, is uh, the pattern of the chain is similar for one to four, periods one to four. And on period five, there is a difference between the previous scenario, which is the troll field is activated to handle substantially higher amounts of CO2 coming from other European sources. 
In terms of transport results, uh, the, sh the ship system design is similar to the first scenario. However, it's needed an additional pipeline of sh offshore pipeline to connect to Toronto Field, as, as well as the number of trips are slightly higher due to increased volumes in, in the Norwegian and Swedish emitters. When it comes to these well results, uh, in this case, in this, implement, this scenario, we have uh, more than double of uh, integration units installed and totaling 15 satellite wells and five integration units. So Aurora, Ismaia, Gamma, they are activated in a similar way as the first scenario. And the, and the new troll field is activated with three integration units and nine satellite wells. In terms of injection and remaining capacity, it's just highlighted here the troll playing a role in handling with this fifth period additional CO2. And also the, the remaining capacity of troll here is out of scale, which is, uh, is greater than four gigatons. When it comes to the costs for this scenario, it's of course higher, but not as substantially higher compared to the amount of CO2 coming on stream. So we have a 5.1 billion euros for the first and for the seven bar configuration, 5.6 for the 15 bar configuration. The first period accounts for the, the investments to set up the pipe, the, the chain, followed by additional wells and the second period and the third period we have uh, additional transport ships to handle the additional co2 as well with the activation of this mehaya gamma so total costs driven by increased co2 co supply therefore troll activation and on the last on the 15 bar configuration patterns are similar for our periods one to two and from periods three to five increased transport CO2 occurs because of the smaller capacity, smaller capa capacity ships acquisition. So one interesting outcome comparing those two network evolutions is since we increase the amount of CO2 in the chain, so it brings the activation of Zmehaya Gamma forward and it, it needs an additional geological storage sites to handle this aggressive assumption of uh, incremental other European sources. So coming to, to the conclusions, here we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna present you the comparison between all the results with in terms of total cost and levelized costs and draw some conclusions of the implementation. So first scenario shows us a higher levelized cost than second scenario. Among the scenarios, uh, higher pressure resulted in higher costs. And this is uh, mostly related to the trade-off between a lower conditioning cost for higher pressure, not being greater than the amount you need extra to have uh, transport ships with higher pressures. So the wall thickness of the transport tanks and the, the size of the ship increase due to this wall thickness and the number of tanks that you need more for the ship are posing a greater cost than the savings you can get from conditioning in this in this implementation. In in terms of uh, connecting the CO2, the intermediate storage hub to the histor geological storage sites, this implementation showed uh, that it's more economical to have pipelines connecting the, the geological sites individually and not like a, a big trunk pipeline and then some other satellite pipelines connecting the fields. This is perhaps due to the amount of CO2 increasing in the later periods, not the first periods. Uh, another conclusion that we, we came out on this um, implementation is that this, the storage costs are largely driven by operational costs and therefore their activation is largely driven by the how much costs the operational costs are lower or higher then it, it tends to go for a cheaper geological storage site so ismaia alpha was not selected among the options due to its smaller capacity and as well as its, its higher costs therefore 
and 12 fields been selected and 12 fields, as I said, is been producing. So there is a lot of uncertainty in the availability of trial to be able to store CO2. However, for this implementation, it was interesting to, to demonstrate the relevance of this field for handling CO2 storage. And in terms of the levelized costs, since we could see uh, on, the, on the breakdown of expenditures, the first periods, they have a much lower CO2 coming on stream and a substantially higher uh, expenditure required to set up the chain. Therefore, first periods have a higher levelized costs and later periods, they have much lower levelized costs. So it's important to account for the evolution of those CO2 chains in terms to have a, as low as is possible levelized costs. But then there is a fine tuning to find the right size of the capacity that you should set up to be able to handle these additional costs in the future. All right, uh, so this was the conclusions for this implementation. Now, in terms of future work, I'm currently developing the life cycle assessments for elements that are not covered by Imperial's in house models, which are conditioning, liquefaction, the ship transportation, and lorry transportation. And once this, these um, assessments are done, they will be coupled to this uh, cost minimization problem. And then the way we will see how the emissions interfere in the optimization chain network. And hopefully this will be, be shown in a case study that will be a, that allow us to validate this model. Uh, so just a uh, uh, note, uh, two publications were derived from this research. The first one states more how this modeling has been set up and it was presented in uh, this greenhouse control technologies beginning of this year. And the second one, it's been a, a smaller implementation of this model in a context of uh, the design of intermediate storage facility in the Greenland region of Norway. Right, so thank you very much for your attention and I think I will hand back to Connor for some questions now. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that, Dennis. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that if you would like to, um, to ask questions, you can do so by putting them into the Q&A um, on the right hand side of your screen. Just before we turn to questions uh, from the audience, uh, maybe we, you could speak a little bit about the cost assumptions that you used in your uh, research and how they impacted on the results. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, thanks. Uh, I mean, this is uh, all evolving technologies. We, we don't have these systems already on stream. So most of the cost figures are from literature, from design assumptions. So they, they still account for some risks of not being implemented yet. So it's a relevant aspect that has been it has to be considered for those implementations. So it's worth to know that um, large scale chains of CO2 with batchwise transportation doesn't exist yet. So we are using assumptions from literature to try to optimize things. So therefore, there is a risk of costs when it comes to reality. OK, perfect. So do you, do you want to take a look at the, uh, the Q&A there and see? Um... Yeah, uh, yeah, there is an anonymous question here saying which of those methods, batchwise or pipeline, are better with respect to CO2 leakage? That's a good question. I think uh, pipeline tends to be more risk free since you have more means of monitoring and control the CO2 flow and you would not transaction in CO2 from one place to another so frequently. However, uh, it brings CO2 in higher pressures. So there is perhaps some issue with the higher pressure of CO2 being transported by pipelines. And if there is a leak, this can result in a higher amount of CO2 being go going to the atmosphere, whereas in the batchwise, it's a lower pressure and lower temperature, so it could be more contained. But this is probably coming um, with the future work to do the life cycle assessments. Then we assessed uh, fugitive emissions and vented emissions that will be able to account properly which method uh, is the best in terms of leakage. 
So there is a, another question here. What would you consider as the most critical set of transportation related data for you to review various chain configurations? Yeah, uh, I think that there, there is um, some interesting challenges on these various transport modes. So first, uh, the batch wise characteristic you have to take to account um, for in the case of nano region implementation, we took account how how many hours per year you have availability to sail in the Norwegian Sea and the North Sea, which is not like uh, all the time. And uh, it, on top of that, we have, uh, for instance, minor cost figures relevant, such as harbor fees to be considered, which varies from port to port, and they do price arbitrage. So uh, this is a, a, a strong element as well. But in general, I think uh, investments for both transport means are the most relevant and you have to bear in mind there is a, always a trade-off when it comes to pipeline. It's a higher investment in the early days and lower operational costs, whereas if you go for batch-wise, it's a lower investment in the early days and higher operational costs throughout the future. But you have also some flexibility with the batch-wise because you can divert the, cheap, the ship to somewhere else, whereas with the pipeline, you probably could use it for a different trans transporting a different gas, but you cannot change the route, for instance. OK, I can't see any other uh, questions in there at the moment, but maybe you could speak a little bit about um, whether you take into account the uncertainty in emissions profiles. Yeah, so in that regard, we are developing uh, another model using the same implementation but to, to, to do a stochastic approach on the emission profiles. So then we will have a bunch of configurations that uh, we can set up our supply chain with the probability of this emission profile happening. So that's the way we, we think we can handle the, this um, uncertainty of the emission profiles. OK, and there's one more question in there from Jenny. Yeah, what are the main challenges associated with implementing the pipeline and batchwise approaches? Yeah, so I think pipeline is the first um, first option of choice when it comes to CCS. Then when you add up the challenges such as geography or uh, environment, for instance, in this particular Norwegian configuration, we, we we couldn't do a pipeline segment from the waste plant to the intermediate storage site because you, you should go through lots of fjords. So this poses a, a huge environmental risk and technical risk. They rather use ships for implementing. So I, I think it always starts with a pipeline being considered as first option. Then depending on how many barriers you add up to this, you start exploring batchwise CO2. However, you should you could start with batchwise in the smaller the smaller scales. So if you have a, a small stationary meter and you do a pilot project of this CCS, you will not construct a pipeline. You go for a lorry or a ship because you don't, you're not sure if this is going to succeed or not. So these are I think these is our these are the main challenges. And I, I believe that in the long long run, let's say further than 30 years period. Once you have established a network, this can be like uh, you can do some pipelines to make it more robust and get a further reach with batchwise transportation. So I think that's that would be my answer to this question, Jenny. That's great. I don't see any other questions in there at the moment. Was there anything else that you wanted to add? Yeah, I think that's that's all. <laughs> Perfect. Good stuff. Well, let's leave it there uh, then for uh, this afternoon. And my thanks uh, again to, to Dennis for today's uh, webinar. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you know people who uh, weren't able to make it today but are interested in watching it back, please do send them uh, the link. Uh, and if you'd like to find out more about our upcoming webinars, you can find all the details on our website uh, and do get in touch with me. Um, my name is Conor McNally. Um, 
if you are interested in presenting your own research or if you'd like to suggest somebody for a future uh, webinar, particularly looking forward to the uh, autumn term. So you'll find uh, my contact details on the Energy Futures website. Uh, but for now, thanks again for joining us and have a great afternoon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.